There are a handful of shows in the history of television that make an impact so large that it shapes TV for decades. MASH, Cheers, Babylon 5, and Buffy are but a few that come to mind. But one of the most memorable was a series about people stranded on a desert island. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful- No, not that one. Not that one either. It was, of course, Lost. This series was not a silly TV show, but rather a game changer. It was not focused on storylines, but rather a perfect combination of character and mystery. Lost is one of those series that still sparks strong emotions from people. Many people love it, and many people hate it. But is the hate for this show misplaced? Is it really that bad? Or could Lost be one of the greatest TV shows of all time? Let's explore the island for ourselves in this episode of Gone, but not forgotten. The story behind Lost is an interesting one. It all started at the ABC Network Retreat, where executives have to pitch ideas for upcoming shows. Lloyd Braun, the president of entertainment for ABC at the time, proposed Castaway, the TV series. Granted, it was a stupid idea, but the person in charge of dramatic programming, Tom Sherman, found it an intriguing one. The green light was given, and Tom, with another writer, wrote up a script. But it came back as a disaster. So Tom always said that whenever he had a project that he had issues getting off the ground, he would say to himself, what would J.J. do? The J.J. he was referring to was J.J. Abrams. By now, Abrams had created the hit TV show Felicity and was currently behind the network's most popular TV series at the time, Alias. So he was approached to see if he would be interested in developing the show. And at first, J.J. was apprehensive about it. All they had was a basic concept, people surviving a plane crash and getting stranded on a deserted island. So Abrams thought, what would intrigue him about such a premise? What if the island wasn't an island? What if there was a mysterious hatch? He thought that the show shouldn't be a standard survival show. He wanted to make the island a character in itself, surrounded by mystery. However, he said he didn't have the time to develop the show alone. So another person had to be tasked to partner with him to create Lost. Sherman thought of a writer he had worked with in the past named Damon Lindelof. By now, Lindelof had been working in Hollywood for years, having worked on shows like Crossing Jordan and Nash Bridges. He had a good relationship with Sherman and the other executives at ABC. He was given the same script to look at and asked his opinion. Lindelof replied that the mystery aspect of the island had to be the heart of the show. But not just the mystery of the island, but the mystery of the survivor's past. He was then introduced to J.J. Abrams, and it was love at first sight. They immediately got each other, and the ideas began to flow. Soon, an outline was written up and then sent in for review. Then the network did something no network had done before. They greenlit the show on the spot. There wasn't even a script yet. And yet, suddenly things began to snowball. As they developed the characters, actors began to come in and read for it. Damon would work on the script during the day and at night write the sides for the actors to use in auditions. The cast for this show was just massive. Within just the first 10 minutes of the pilot, we are introduced to... Jack, Kate, Sawyer, Saeed, Locke, Hurley, Michael, Walt, Jin, Son, Boone, Shannon... Six and a half hours later... Charlie, Claire, and Rose. <sighs> then as the show went on, more characters were introduced, like... Anna Lucia, Libby, Mr. Echo, Juliet... Two thousand years later... Alex, Bernard, Desmond... And Ben. Did I miss anyone? <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Let's go over some of them. Matthew Fox played Jack Shepard, the first and last face that we see in the series. Jack was a spinal surgeon with a strong moral code, struggling with a hero complex, daddy issues, and a chronic desire to fix everything. The story behind the character of Jack was fascinating. Originally, he was going to die right in the pilot. In the first episode, Kate, Jack, and Charlie search the cockpit of the plane and find the pilot, who's then killed by a mysterious creature. They're chased by the monster, and Jack disappears to fake out the audience. 
Originally, he was supposed to be found dead in a tree, and then Kate would become the leader of the survivors. JJ said that if they had gone down that route, Michael Keaton would have played Jack. Keaton and Abrams had become friends, and Keaton said that he wanted to play a small part in one of his projects. But the network executive said that if they had killed the character, the audience would have felt betrayed and angry. So Jack would survive. As for Kate, she was a criminal on the run. She was strong and kicked ass, but was also a tragic figure who killed her mother's abusive husband when she found out he was her biological father. But after a while, it just became ridiculous. Kate's mother betrayed her. She got her childhood love killed. She was betrayed by friends, got married, then left her husband, and had a U.S. Marshal obsessed with her. When it came to Kate, everything that could go wrong always went wrong. The funny thing was that whenever someone found out what Kate's crime was, they acted like it was the most horrible thing that anyone could do. This always bugged me. They really should have made her crime worse, like maybe a kid got caught in the explosion and died. You know, make it messed up. It's still one of those things that bugs me. Many actresses were auditioned for the role of Kate, but when they saw Evangeline Lilly's audition tape, they knew she was special. She was able to convey Kate's vulnerability and strength on screen, but even though she got the role, there was a problem. Evangeline Lilly was a Canadian citizen, and she couldn't work in the United States without a visa. The problem was they had to shoot in two weeks, and she was still waiting on an answer from immigration. So even though she had the role, they still had to keep auditioning actresses. Much to the relief of the showrunners, Evangeline got the visa just days before shooting. Saeed was played by Naveen Andrews, who was a former torturer with a, well, tortured past, and had a long lost love that he would do anything he could to be with her again. I loved Saeed. He was a badass, and he could intimidate you with just one look. He was able to tell that you were lying by having a brief conversation. He just kicked ass. Unfortunately, toward the end of the show, his character wound up being neglected and became a husk of what he used to be. Such a shame. John Locke was played by Terry O'Quinn, who was offered the role by J.J. Abrams since they had worked together on Alias. The funny thing is that Terry didn't even know what role he would play when he agreed to be on the show. He just wanted to work on a J.J. Abrams project. It was a leap of faith, and boy, did it pay off. John Locke was just incredible. He was a man shrouded in mystery at the start of the show. He was the hunter of the group, who felt a deep connection to the island. One of the best episodes of the first season is about Locke's origin, called The Walkabout. This episode gives us one of the most shocking twists on the show, where we learn Locke is paralyzed, and he has been healed now that he's on the island. After that episode, it only got better, as we learn about his horrible relationship with his father. If I tried to talk about the monster that was Locke's father, we would be here for a month. So I will just say that one of the most popular flashback episodes for fans involved Locke's bastard of a father. Sawyer was another fan favorite character, played by Josh Holloway. Holloway played James Sawyer Ford as a damaged, tragic character whose self-loathing shaped his actions. Sawyer's dry and sarcastic humor offset the darkness, with his wide variety of nicknames becoming part of the show's most memorable lines, not to mention his catchphrase, Son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. The character of Sawyer was very different in the beginning. He was supposed to be a Gordon Gecko Armani wearing con man, but Josh Holloway came in and suddenly the character morphed to suit his cadence. Holloway said that he got the role because during his audition, he forgot a line and kicked a chair in frustration. This jogged his memory and he finished his monologue. Josh said that it was him kicking that chair that got him the role since he came off as a bad boy. One of Sawyer's best episodes comes in Season 3, called The Brick. In this episode, Sawyer's character arc intersects with that of Locke's, as they both come face to face with the main source of their pain, both literally and figuratively. The end of this episode has always been, for me, an example of when Lost truly got it right. The tension of these storylines had been building for a while, but in this episode, it stretched to the absolute limit. 
the infamous scene towards the end of the brig finally culminated in an ending that was shocking and emotionally satisfying for both Sawyer and Luck. After that, the show did something really interesting with Sawyer. Instead of continuing the self-hating, nickname-spewing character he was, he now became a caring and righteous man, ready to lead and defend his friends until the end. Michael and Walt were two characters that actually lost their potential. Harold Perrineau played Michael, who was a man who wanted to be a father to his son Walt. Michael's story was so sad. He was in a relationship with Walt's mother, who left him for her boss. She then took Walt away from him and hid the letters he wrote to him over the years. Walt was wasted potential. He was set up as a possible psychic magical child trope. I was very interested in seeing how his story was going to play out. Unfortunately, he was the victim of one of the biggest mistakes on the show. In the first season, every episode took place in a day. The problem began when the actor who played Walt, Malcolm David Kelly, began to grow insanely quickly. Since every episode was a day, it was impossible to incorporate his physical changes into the show. So he was written out, and the planned Walt storyline was scrapped. Looking back, I think this could have been easily fixed. When Walt disappeared at the end of season 1, you could have used his sudden age change as another island mystery. I also feel that Walt should have come back to the island in the later seasons. Though he did appear again in the epilogue of the series, which was nice but it still felt like we missed out on a whole aspect of the show. Perrineau had a hard time during his time on the series, feeling that Michael was not given any storylines to flesh out the character. If you watch the show, it's pretty obvious that Michael is given the short end of the stick. According to Perrineau, he was forced out of the show when he complained about this. He felt that he was labeled an ungrateful and demanding actor, so he was written out of the series at the end of season two. But hey, at least he went off with a bang. You can go now, Michael. Who are you? Charlie was a heroin-addicted, washed-up rock star played by Dominic Monaghan. Charlie had a protector complex. Most of his role in this series was focused on his relationship with Claire, played by Emily Duravin. Their relationship was very sweet. He became her son's surrogate father, and he seemed to live to make her smile. Monaghan wanted to be on Lost to avoid being typecast as a magical creature. He impressed everyone so much with his acting ability that they tweaked the character of Charlie to match Monaghan's age. Originally, Charlie was supposed to be a washed-up rock star from the 1980s, so they de-aged him. And one of the most shocking moments on the show was when Charlie died. It was a sucker punch for viewers, as he was so charming and sweet. This is funny because Damon and JJ said that they would never kill off the character. It was Monaghan's idea to kill off Charlie, as he felt Charlie's plot lines were dried up by the end of season one, and he wanted to move on. Claire was played by Emily Duravin and was the love interest for Charlie. She was pregnant when she crashed on the island and gave birth to her son, Aaron. Dominic and Emily were friends behind the scenes, and you can tell this boosted their performances. It's later revealed that she was Jack's half-sister and wound up going nuts and adopting a squirrel baby. If you have seen the show, you will get that joke. Sun and Jin were a Korean married couple that had a troubled marriage at the start of the series, but by the end, their relationship was the greatest love story on the show. I know it's a controversial thing to say, but I think it's one of the greatest love stories on TV. Sun was the daughter of a mob boss. When Jin asked him for his permission to marry her, he was hired by her father and wound up being his enforcer. Jin hated carrying out her father's orders, but he loved Sun so much that he did practically anything he was told to do. Sun was played by Yeon Jin Kim, who came in to read for Kate, but when they saw that she spoke Korean and learned of her fame in Korean cinema, they decided to write a role specifically for her. So Sun was created, and because of this, the character of Jin was written for her to play off of. Daniel Day Kim got the role, and boy, that was a great choice. Their chemistry was amazing. It was so good that when they died in the last season, it was devastating to fans. I'm sure many people were crying at home during their death scene. I was one of them. Then there is Hurley. And Hurley? Well, Hurley, you're the best. 
Can I just hug you? Dude. My favorite character from this series. Jorge Garcia played Hugo Hurley Reyes with a genuine sweetness that you couldn't help but love. While others struggled with their past, fought one another, and were generally selfish, Hurley just wanted to make everyone happy. His arc was one of the most subtle and the most complete. Some of his best episodes on this show were Numbers and Everyone Hates Hugo. Jorge Garcia had the character of Hurley created for him. He had appeared in an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm called The Carpool Lane, which is still among many Curb fans' favorite episodes. It is so weird to see the audition tapes on the Season 1 Lost DVD and watch one of the most lovable Lost actors auditioning for Sawyer. Hurley's flashbacks showed him winning the lottery in one of the show's earliest twists, with some very key numbers. These numbers will go on to be iconic in the overall fabric of the show. It's also one of the most frustrating aspects of the entire series for certain Lost fans, as the explanation for the numbers are never given a clear-cut answer. We learned toward the end of the last season that Jacob created the numbers while looking for candidates, but it's left up to the viewer's interpretation what those meant to him. So was it the number of times that Jacob visited them? Was it when those candidates did something to prove their worthiness to run the island? Was it the number of times they made mistakes in their lives that would affect their possible island inheritance? Or something else? In an interview for E! Online, Damon Lindelof summed it up when he said, There are some questions that are very engaging and interesting, and then there are other questions that we have no interest whatsoever in answering. We call it the midi-chlorian debate, because at a certain point, explaining something mystical demystifies it. To try and have a character come and say, here's what the numbers mean, actually makes every usage of the numbers up to that point less interesting. You can actually watch Star Wars now, and when Obi-Wan talks about the Force to Luke for the first time, it loses its luster because the Force has been explained as sort of little biological agents that are in your bloodstream. So you go, oh, I liked Obi-Wan's version a lot better. Which in the case of our show is the numbers are bad luck. They keep popping up in Hurley's life. They appear on the island. But if you're watching the show for a detailed explanation of what the numbers mean, and I'm not saying you won't see more of them, then you will be disappointed by the end of season six. But let us talk about the pilot episode. Nowadays with streaming, the process of creating a show is designed with a full season in mind, so the characters, their arcs, and the setting are meticulously planned out from the get-go. The pilot is just a set piece for a 10-13 to 13 episode arc that will conclude at the end of the season. But back in the heyday of network TV, a pilot episode was what had the importance for a TV show. It was what had to hook the audience from them switching the channel so the pilot had to be well thought out with a script written out months in advance. The rest was a vague outline. Lost broke those rules in so many ways. One insane thing is that the pilot had a budget of $13 million. This was the biggest budget given to a TV show at that time in television history. It's no wonder they purchased a real airplane, chopped it up, and shipped it to a beach in Hawaii. I love how the set designer says this. And then we started talking and we're like, no, JJ wants a wide body. It's coming from Australia. A couple of days later, I bought an L-1011. That is insane. The amount of detail on this set was incredible. You know what's really messed up though? The man who was responsible for one of the biggest hits on network TV, Lloyd Braun, was fired because he approved the budget for that pilot. It is so unfair. The network probably made four times that in the first season alone, and yet, he got canned. Lost was a show built on mystery. With a rich, constantly evolving mythology, viewers were always analyzing the show. What was the island? What was in the hatch? Who were the others? What was the monster? What happens when you don't press the button? Who were the Dharma Initiative? Why are there polar bears on a tropical island? What happened to the French woman? Who is Jacob? What's the deal with Jack's tattoos? Uh, no, not that one. No one cares about that one. As the season went on, other characters were introduced. I wish I could go over all of them, but this episode is long enough as it is. I do want to talk about a few of them, though. Let us start with probably the most controversial character on the show, Anna Lucia, played by Fast and the Furious star, Michelle Rodriguez. Many people say she was only on the show for one season because she had a DUI during filming. 
but Damon and executive producer Carlton Cuse have confirmed that she was always going to die at the end of the second season. I felt Anna Lucia didn't get a fair shake on the show. Her flashbacks were great. I love seeing her strained relationship with her mother and how she bonds with Jack's father because of their self-hatred. However, she didn't have a lot of scenes with the main cast. She was supposed to be set up as a love interest to Jack that would add another character to be involved in the love triangle between Jack, Sawyer, and Kate. Which I guess would make it a love square? Whatever. The fact is she had more chemistry with the rest of the cast than Jack. So that plotline was abandoned. I did like the love scene between Sawyer and her though. It would have been an interesting avenue to explore in the series had she not died. But with such a large cast, many characters would fall by the wayside. Still, the death of her and Libby at the hands of Michael was a game changer for the show, as it showed the audience that no one was safe on the island. Speaking of Libby's death, Cynthia Watros couldn't stop crying when she had to play dead. Linda Law said, um, One of the things that, you know, people always ask us, have you made mistakes on the show? Do you have regrets about the show? One of those regrets is that we weren't really able to service Cynthia Watros as an actress better um, in season two, obviously. Um, uh, there was a lot of grumbling about, the, as there was this year, that we weren't giving our regulars enough screen time. And with Mr. Echo and Anna Lucia sort of joining, you know, the, the cast of characters, Libby sort of got short shrift, so... I was really upset when she died, as she was Hurley's true love, and I wanted to learn more about her past connection to him. Still, she came back to the series in flashbacks, so we did get to see a little more of her. It's better than nothing, I guess. Rose and Bernard were my second favorite love story on the show. Bernard was a dentist who met and fell in love with Rose while she was stuck in the snow. They had a whirlwind romance, and after five months, he proposed to her. Rose then told him that she had terminal cancer, and she would die in a year. This is loosely based on actress L. Scott Caldwell's life, as she married her husband knowing he had cancer, and would sadly die while she was filming the show. Desmond was another fan-favorite character. His love story with Penny was the thing of romance novels. Penny's father was a billionaire named Charles Widmore. It would later be revealed that he had a complex connection to the island, Widmore thought Desmond was beneath him when he asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. One of my favorite scenes of the series is this one. This is a 60-year McCutcheon, named after Anderson McCutcheon, esteemed admiral from the Royal Navy. Admiral McCutcheon was a great man, Hugh. This was his crowning achievement. This swallow is worth more than you could make in a month. To share it with you would be a waste and a disgrace to the great man who made it. Because you, Hume, will never be a great man. Desmond would wind up having a critical role on the series finale. Juliet was a third season addition played by Elizabeth Mitchell. In true Lost fashion, we the audience change our opinion of the character depending on the episode. When we first see her, she's just another mysterious other. Then she's a love interest for Jack? Then a character we shouldn't trust? Or should we? From her first moment, the Juliet roller coaster was sprinkled with desperation, sadness, love, and tragedy, as we learned that she was just as trapped as our main characters. The first time around, I didn't know what to make of her relationship with Sawyer. It builds throughout seasons 3 and 4, and flourishes in the episode Le Fleur. Just like the other characters on the show, you grow to love her despite her actions. Which is why her death was so emotionally brutal to Lost fans. It's rare to hear about any Lost fans that were not emotionally affected by her death scene. Finally, we have the main antagonist on the show, Benjamin Ben Linus, played by Michael Emerson, who was amazing. Emerson was only supposed to be in a few episodes as a spy who was caught by the survivors but he impressed everyone with his performance so much that he was made the main villain of the series. It was this scene in the episode called The Whole Truth, where Ben is let out of his cell by Jack and Locke to have breakfast, and then goes into a terrifying monologue about what he would do to them if he was one of the others. 
after he finishes, he just says, You guys got any milk? No one says milk quite as creepy as Michael Emerson. There was a great moment on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon where he recites Little Boy Blue. Little Boy Blue, come blow your horn. The sheep's in the meadow. The cow's in the corn. <laughs> where is the boy who looks after the sheep? He's under the haystack, fast asleep. <laughs> Will you wake him? Oh, no, not I. <laughs> For if I do, he surely will cry. <laughs> Guys, I think he murdered little boy Blue. The best episodes on this show tend to vary on your favorite character. One episode in my top five was an episode called Ab Eterno. This final season episode revolves around a recurring character named Richard Alpert, whose flashback was worth the wait. It's emotionally heartbreaking and answers the question, is Richard immortal or does he just have really good moisturizer? And eyeliner. I'm just kidding, Nestor Carbonell's eyelashes are naturally that dark. It's something that has been talked about so much that Carbonell poked fun at himself by filming a comedy sketch for the San Diego Comic Con Lost panel. <laughs> this is cold. This is, I asked for onyx. I only use onyx. What is this, uh, an amateur hour? Is this your first fucking cut? You know what's going on? Are you Regardless of your favorite, universally, Stranger in a Strange Land is considered by the majority of Lost fans to be the weakest episode of the entire series. Rumor has it that the network was pressuring Lindelof and Q's to keep the show going indefinitely, or at least for a decade. This episode was supposedly crafted to showcase where the show was headed if they had to keep draining the well for flashbacks. They used the origin story of Jack's tattoos, yeah. They used that stupid aspect of the character to negotiate shorter seasons and a definitive end to the series. Hughes and Lindelof didn't think 22 episode seasons were the way to go. Looking back, I agree. Some storylines were stretched too far, some interesting characters were dropped from the weight of the story. If it aired today, it'd maybe run 3 seasons and 13 episodes each. The music of Lost was also revolutionary. Michael Giacchino had worked with J.J. Abrams back on Alias, and when he was asked to do the music for Lost, he had one stipulation. He wanted an orchestra. Sadly, many current TV shows just use synthesizers, but Giacchino felt he could experiment with new sounds and fully bring the emotion of the series to life. He started by telling the producers to not send him scripts to read. He asked instead to send him the full episodes so he could watch them and write music in the moment. He said he wanted to make music with the audience's reaction in mind. He also used pieces of the airplane for percussions. As for the iconic sound of the smoke monster, many different sounds were used, such as different sound frequencies. But the most interesting sound used for the smoke monster was the sound of a New York taxi cab's printer. Giacchino has gone on to have a massive career in Hollywood with his latest score for The Batman and his direction for Werewolf by Night, earning him the love of comic book fans everywhere. Another aspect of the show that was a game changer was the marketing. There were websites set up by the network with new content to expand the lore. As the DVDs came out, they had Easter eggs with small little nuggets of clues. There was a web-based video game that fans could interact with called The Lost Experience. There was a Lost Magazine. Hell, there was even a novel based on a quick joke in one episode called Bad Twin, which is still in print today. This was groundbreaking marketing, and it was the foundation of how TV and films are promoted to fans today. A big issue that many people have with this show are the mysteries of the island. I felt the same frustrations when the show originally aired, but after re-watching the show, I realized what was causing my issues. Lost at the time was plagued by gaps between episodes. Reruns, hiatus, and a writer's strike stretched out the wait time between episodes. 
you have a completely different experience when you binge the episodes. A lot of questions were answered throughout the show, but I had just missed it at the time. Rewatching the show was fascinating, as you start catching little things being set up to be paid off in future seasons. There was this one scene where Saeed talks about a compass being broken. In the episode, he tells Jack that it's broken because it was pointing west when it should have been pointing north. This is paid off seasons later when we find out that the island moves. Other examples are Radzinski being casually mentioned in Desmond's first flashback episode as a quick story by the previous hatch technician, Kelvin Inman. See that brown stain there? That's Radzinski. He put a shotgun in his mouth when I was asleep. And the bitch of it was, I only had 108 minutes to bury the poor bastard. Seasons later, we get to meet Radzinski, and we find out his reason for being in the hatch to begin with. Even the skeletons on this show would have arcs. The Adam and Eve skeletons found in the first season are explained in the last season. The skeleton of Roger Workman that is found by Hurley is Ben's father, who he kills in cold blood. Sure, they don't answer everything, but if you watch the show again, they do reveal many mysteries. Still, there is one moment on the show that I have never gotten over. It's in Season 6, Episode 15, called Across the Sea, where we learn the secrets of the island. There is one scene in particular, one line, that still sends me into a rage. How did you get here? The same way you got here. By accident. How long have Every you... question I answer will simply lead to another question. You should rest. Just be grateful you're alive. What? Are you f***ing kidding me? What the f*** are you talking about? You mother f***s. You have the balls to tell me that sh I'm gonna f*** and then c*** One eternity later. So, yeah, it made me upset. This moment has divided the Lost fandom and has been a big stumbling block for viewers. I respect people on both sides. After all, great shows are supposed to spark debate. If we didn't disagree on something, then it wouldn't be interesting, right? Now, we have come to the controversial ending. When it comes to the Lost finale, there tend to be two camps. The mythology and the characters. The ending of the show was character-based. Don't get me wrong, we do have a satisfying ending for the island. But it was the characters' fates that ended the series with a heartfelt thank you to the fans. Sadly, this was not exactly set up correctly, and many people, most of which tuned in just for the finale, that didn't watch the show as much as a regular viewer, were confused. This led to the biggest misconception of the show. People suddenly started saying, You all died in the plane crash, but now you're stuck in purgatory. As a fan, this is so frustrating. Let us be clear. Seasons 1 through 5 and half of season 6 were all real. Only the flash sideways in season 6 took place in purgatory, after every character had died either on the island or afterward, so they could resolve their unfinished business. This is where I think the writers messed up. This should have been explained much earlier, in season 6, instead of suggesting that the sideways was an alternate reality of what happened if the plane didn't crash. It was confusing and probably led to the explanation that was shown very, very late in the finale, to be misunderstood and overlooked. Think about just how much more satisfying the character arcs in Season 6 would have been if we knew the sideways took place after the island's events. Jack still had unresolved father issues at the time of his death, so in limbo, he came to terms with it by being a father. Hurley inherited the island and became a strong leader, so in Limbo, he was confident, well-liked, and content. Except for his unresolved relationship with Libby. Sawyer was a cop in Purgatory, because he wanted to be a better person. And Kate's still on the run because she learned nothing. I'm joking, of course. Still, the scenes where each character makes a connection during the finale are an emotional chokehold to your heart. Once you grasp the aspects of The Flash sideways, it's actually pretty great. So after rewatching this show, I have to say that Lost, while not perfect, is still incredible. Let's put aside the groundbreaking effect that it had on media. 
it was well written, and it kept you engaged for the entire run. Not a lot of shows can say that. Some people may have fallen off after a few seasons, but if you binge it now, I promise, you'll find yourself glued to the screen. Now normally this is the part of the show that I ask the question of should it come back, but we all know the answer to that question. I would rather ask, was the show as bad as people have said? No. No it isn't. There's a reason why Lost continues to live on with dozens of rewatch shows and podcasts on YouTube and other platforms. Lost was a game changer that transformed the TV landscape. The series broke through viewer barriers. People who were not into a sci-fi mystery show were suddenly having passionate conversations with hardcore geeks. That's amazing, and many TV shows have tried to replicate that formula with mixed results. But this show still holds up, and if you're ready to have your mind blown, then you can watch it for free on Freevee. Or if you're like me and want to watch it without commercials, then you can watch it on your Hulu account. So if you're ready to get on that plane and visit a place of mystery and excitement, then I suggest you sit back and watch Lost. Just watch out for that smoke monster. I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time for the next episode of Gone, But Not Forgotten.